So, Boris Johnson announces his departure from number 10 in the same way he has occupied that high office, full of bluster, lies and self-delusion. Yes, it's the evening we've all been waiting for. Welcome to a special edition of Friday Night with Byline Times. With me, Peter Jukes. And me, Hardeep Matharu. And over the next hour, we'll be bringing you what the papers didn't say. And what the TV didn't usually tell you. Well, coming up, Boris Johnson, our part in his downfall. Yes, for six years, Byline has been uncovering the malfeasance and lies around the Vote Leave campaign. For three and a half years, Byline Times has been cataloguing the litany of scandals, errors and catastrophes surrounding in the wake of Boris Johnson. So tonight, we'll be talking to the whole team. We'll be talking to Sam Bright, Sean Norris, Adam Bienkov, and we'll be joined on this cushy blue sofa by none other than the inestimable and irreversible Otto English. And what next for the Conservative Party? Will it go back to its One Nation roots or continue further down the path of Boris Johnson's populism? Well, we'll be joined in the studio, talking very shortly to Claire Purcell, who's a Conservative councillor and a former special advisor, about the leadership race, which has already begun, and what this might mean for the party. And in a busy news week, there was another scandal that was confirmed by none other than Boris Johnson himself, that when he was foreign secretary, he met informally at a party in secret Alexander Lebedev, the former Russian KGB agent, very shortly after the Salisbury poisonings. Well, what does this mean for the investigation of Russian interference in British politics? Well, we'll be joined in the studio by Arthur Snell, the former diplomat and author, to get his insights. Now, as you can see, we do not have any hedge funds like GB News funding us. We work on a shoestring. We don't have any former KGB agents bankrolling us, nor do we have Jerry Hall's sadly ex-husband funding us. It's all down to you. You are our only oligarchs, you at home, who support us. And there's ways you can do so by buying the newspaper, of course, but on Byline TV. The three main ways are this. The first is our spanking new, wonderful platform, byline.tv, and you can join there. And you can also go to patreon.com, patreon.com forward slash byline TV. Or if you're watching on YouTube now, you can subscribe. And what happens if you subscribe, Hardeep? Well, if you subscribe, and we would encourage you, as we say, to head over to our unique platform, byline.tv uh, forward slash join to become a member, um, you will get many other features. So there are literally dozens of hours of unseen unique footage, including all of this year's Byline Festival. You get to go behind the scenes with our producers and... As Peter was alluding to, you also get to interact with the guests on our shows, including tonight in our After Dark Q&A, which will take place after this main live show ends with myself and Peter Dukes, Otto English and Arthur Snell. So if you do head over to byline.tv forward slash join, if you do that right now and sign up, you can put any of your questions to the four of us after this show ends. And just to point out, you'll find... The, the, the after, show, after dark show on the members area when you sign up. You get into the members area and it will be there five minutes after the show finishes, probably about five past eight. Now, tonight, for special edition, given the momentous events of this week, we have a new function and that's called Super Chat. Mm -hmm. Super Chat is a function on YouTube, which if you don't want to sign up and go through that rigmarole of that process of joining the platform, we'd like you to do so because we can plan and create special events for you. But you can ask just one question of us. It'll flash up. George, our producer, will make sure we see it and we'll answer it in real time as quickly as possible. We'll remind you of that throughout the show. You might want to ask something of Claire, Arthur Snell, Otto English, or either myself and Hardy. Or just comment on something. If yeah. You you know, if you, there's something you uh, urgently want to say about anything that we discuss on the show or an insight that you might have, do pop it into the chat and we'll try and get to it. Now, not only this week were there certain events happening in Westminster, you might have noticed, we're also putting our print edition to bed while we're trying to until earthquakes happened. Well, let's go not to the print front page, that's coming out next week, but to our digital front page. 
and that is vacancy in office. Boris Johnson resigns. Starts with a piece, great piece by Nafiz Ahmed, a special investigations editor, about how the, there's just a vacuum at the centre of power and if left unoccupied, the far right might occupy it. There's also great pieces as we scroll down by uh, Adam Bienkoff, our political uh, editor, and also by Sean Norris, who looks at the misogyny around the pincher allegations and her great title, That's the Way the King of the World Ends, Not with a Bang, but a Pincher. So there's lots more to see on the front page, but without further ado, let's look at what's happening down now with none other than Claire Pearsall, a former SPAD in the Immigration Ministry, I believe, also works with an MP and is a councillor in her own right. So let's look at this week first before we look at the future, Claire. How do you feel? Are you saddened by what's happened? No. <laughs> I should be brutally honest. I've been calling for this uh, for some time. I've been one of the lone voices out there and I've been treated quite badly for it. Um, people don't like you to have an opinion in Westminster, especially when it goes against theirs. But I must admit, um, it was exciting to be at the seat of power and watch it all crumble. But I feel really quite sad for my party. I still love my party. So to watch it pull itself apart even further is, is really awful. How did that, the inner dynamics work? I mean, we've been talking about his potential resignation, obviously, since, well, Lord Guide was the most recent one, obviously Pincher just after that. But ever since that no confidence vote, obviously he won that, but 75% of backbenchers wanted him to go, had no confidence in him. Have you been feeling, you've been calling for a while, for criticising his leadership, a groundswell around you, are people saying, we understand you, Claire, or is there a lot of bitterness to be played out? Like the end of Thatcher, there was a lot, there was years of rancour after that. There is, and it's going to take a long time to sort out. And the party is very, very divided. But you could see, uh, I suppose, especially over the last fortnight, it's deteriorated. And I think people were waking up to the fact that the Prime Minister himself has not acted with integrity. And I think the final straw came with the Christopher Pincher allegations of, you know, his appalling behaviour, which is not unknown in Westminster. But before Hardeep comes in there, just, yeah, was it actually a calculation, a kind of, well, his losing support? Or do you think, from left and right, One Nation Conservatives, Libertarians, there was a consensus that actually it's not about his politics, it's about his behaviour and his probity? That's it. It's about honesty and integrity. And I think that there were quite a lot of people who were teetering on the brink of, of saying that they had no confidence, but didn't quite know when was the right time. And I think that was the real point at which it changed. And that's when the power shifted. I mean, we've seen a number of candidates put themselves forward already into the leadership race. Uh, the most prominent is... Of course, the Chancellor, or former. former Chancellor, ready for Rishi, has just gone live this evening. Um, but, I mean, to be honest, so many of these candidates, some, not all of them, but a lot of them, like Rishi Sunak, sat there, you know, day after day, propping up Boris Johnson's government. They're now talking about integrity and honesty. To how do you think the party's going to tackle that, Claire? That, you know, it, actually, it wasn't just about Johnson. The lack of integrity and honesty seemed to seep into everything because it has been three years and everyone there did sustain this man in office. There were a vast number who did. You're right. And I think it's going to be a really interesting contest. And I do think that people like Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid, if he puts his hat in the ring, mm -hmm. will be looked at as not being totally honest. They, stood, they sat there in Cabinet, they supported the Prime Minister through thick and thin, and I think that's going to reflect badly upon them. Mm -hmm. So we really do need to reset the party as a whole and bring it back to the more one-nation conservatism you know, and that's where we need to see the candidates. And uh, there's Tom Tugendhat. He launched his campaign this morning. And that's what he's calling for. It's a clean slate. It's looking at the economy first and foremost. So I think those kind of candidates will be looked at a lot more favourably than perhaps the old guard will be. I just wondered on that, just back to Sunak himself, he got a fine too, didn't he? Yeah, he did. So he has a criminal offence. He conducted a criminal offence. Yeah. I'm... And and the whole issue about... But I'm just saying that yeah, that, that, yeah, that yeah. happened. Um, and the whole issue about his tax green card, non-domiciled tax status overseas trust. 
Could that not come to haunt him a bit if we're looking for a clean, you know, a clean slate, a fresh atmosphere in number 10? Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that the green card and non-don status is uh, really relevant. The fine, not so much, because when you look at it, he did pop his head around a door and then managed to get involved in... Keir Starmer would have resigned under that basis. Oh, yeah, I think Keir Starmer has been incredibly lucky um, with his timing on that one. But that's another debate for another day. But I do think, actually, the non-don status and the green card is a big issue. And the fact that he didn't come out honestly and say, yeah, actually, I do have these, and didn't treat it with the seriousness I think it deserved. Mm -hmm. So that will get held against him. And when you start looking at the very flashy graphics that he's just put out. This is very slick. He's been working on this for months. Since December. Apparently, the site was registered in December. Mm. I mean, Claire, for you, so, you know, you believe firmly in sort of more traditional conservative mm. values, the One Nation principles. In the last three years, just give us an insight into, in a way, what's it been like to be a One Nation conservative during the time of Boris Johnson? What do you think are some of the worst things that people who are not Conservatives will have thought about Conservatives? And which of those do you think are unfair in the wider sense that Johnson isn't what Conservatism traditionally stands for or always has? It's been a very lonely space to occupy, to be honest. And you get treated as if you're some kind of traitor. That's how toxic mm. the party became. Things like the tax rises. Mm. I vehemently oppose those. Being a Conservative means that I don't go for tax rises. It's, it's just against everything. We have to be fiscally competent, but not to that extent. And I think it was just the whole not being honest, not sticking to a story, you turning at every opportunity, looking back to last summer when we were dealing with free school meals for children. Mm. You know, we've been up that mountain once, he'd marched us up there, he'd U-turned us and come back down again, and here we go, you know, roundabout. He didn't learn his lesson, and I think that was the point. Uh, a lot of us just all held our head in our hands and said, we're never going to get our party back. I have promised to introduce Super Chats, so thank you, Jim, for your first Super Chat. And I, I'm going to ask this to Claire, because it is relevant. Jim's asked, and you expect Scotland to want to stay in the Union. I'm 43 and never felt so separated from the rest of the UK bring it on, the end is nice. So, mm. Conservative and Unionist Party, mm. how does that sit in a party which I've seen senior UUP, you know, Unionist yeah. politicians in Northern Ireland say, no, we trust Dublin more than London these days, not the DUP, the UUP, Deputy Mike Nesbitt, Deputy Leader, because what Boris Johnson's party was English nationalism. Can you understand Jim's point there? that from, you know, it's been an English nationalist party under Boris Johnson. It absolutely has, and it's become very populist. And you look at where things have gone wrong in America and in parts of Europe, where you have a completely populist president or prime minister, it doesn't bode well for the rest of the country. I'm very much a unionist. I want uh, Scotland to remain. I don't want them to go off and seek independence. I want to bring Northern Ireland back to trusting us rather than looking at Dublin for their examples. So I can completely understand that. Um, I think it's a very valid point and we're going to have to work very, very hard to get that confidence back. I look at the vote, hasn't the, the, the Labour vote has crashed, in, but the, it's getting ahead of Conservative. So, so even if there are some One Nation candidates who are beginning to put themselves forward and perhaps the party decides it's better to go back that way, where does that leave uh, the European Research Group wing, sort of the hard Brexiter wing, where does that leave all of those who liked this populism under Johnson, the culture warriors? You know, what, do you think that is, you know, a bit like, you know, predecessors of, of Johnson, you know, David Cameron had, uh, you know, the Eurosceptics, Theresa May then had the people who love Johnson. <laughs> what do you think will come next in terms of the opposition to someone who does try to take the Conservatives either back to something more traditional or in a new direction, focused on sort of the cost of living crisis, integrity? Do you think you'll, they'll be able to do that? I think it's going to be very, very difficult. However, we are looking down the barrel of another election coming up in, what, two years' time? Mm. So I think that MPs aren't stupid as a whole. They will look at, we have elections coming up, there will be council elections. There's an awful lot of pressure on them to now get this right, because otherwise the Conservative Party are looking at electoral oblivion. We've seen it happen before, you know, history mm. has a, a pattern to it. So I, that will form part of their basis. So they might 
squinny on the sidelines to begin with and they might be difficult in the chamber. But I think in the long run, we all have to come together. If it is a One Nation candidate who isn't tarred by being in the cabinet, the current cabinet, then I think that it can work. But it's going to be extremely difficult and it's going to require people to come to a little bit of a compromise and they're not quite as good at that as they'd like mm. to think. Mm. Claire, I'm going to ask you beyond the party politics this, another super chat. We've promised on these super chats and relates more across party consensus and parliamentary standards. So it's number three asks us, says, states, we need an honesty in public life law. Now, the ministerial code was changed after being more honoured in the breach than the observance and changed so that no longer transparency, uh, lack, no conflict of interest, all the things Boris Johnson and other ministers have been caught out on. Would there be a cross-party consensus, do you think, now, given the turbulent experience of the last two years, for stronger regulation of the ministerial code and outside compliance, or, and stronger regulation against deceiving the House. We have a still, Boris Johnson, if he's still an MP in October, faces a disciplinary committee, doesn't he, the standards hearing. Do you think there's a cross-party consensus now across the Conservatives, Lib Dems, Labour, Scottish Nationalists, to have firmer regulation about ministerial behaviour and, and, you know, statements in the House being honest? It's definitely something that has cross-party support. I'm not sure that regulation is quite the way to go. I'm not sure that we want to start putting things on statute books. But independence, then, of the... Yeah, I, there is. And there was also a call uh, from cross-party committees for a code of conduct for MPs, which will lay out extremely clearly and explicitly what their behaviour is supposed to be. Right. And you may think it's going to, you know, this is ridiculous, you shouldn't have to tell somebody that they shouldn't bully staff members pinch. and they shouldn't pinch people and behave in that kind of manner. But unfortunately, history has shown us that we do have to lay it out very, very clearly. So I hope that comes forward. It looks a bit authoritarian, but if we have it written down, you can go and point to something and say, you've breached that. We need to now remove the whip while we investigate further. And I many companies it, do that. It's absolutely. not, you know, this it's not unusual. Yeah. So why shouldn't Westminster be subject to the same standards as business? Claire, thank you so much, and hope to join us again as it evolves. Oh, just one last question: Have you yeah. have you said you're supporting any candidate yet? I have actually. Um, it, Tom Teagenhat, who is a, a neighbouring MP for where I live, and uh, I think he would be superb at the job. Very good, and it's a great segue for me for our next sex section because Tom Tugendhat, as you might know, has a military background, very strong in defence of Ukraine and countering Russian interference. Slightly buried among the scandals of this week, or rather the sort of end of Boris Johnson's reign, was his cross-questioning in the Liaison Commission, Committee, which touched on a subject we at Byline Times have been investigating for two and a half years. In fact, it goes back to a piece Otto English wrote on Byline Times in 2019 about questions about Boris Johnson's relationship with the Lebedevs, Evgeny and Alexander, and concerns in 2018-19 that he, they were still close to the KGB, at least the father, former KGB agent, and that Boris Johnson, it had been revealed, had turned up to a party in Perugia in their villa Terra Nova without his security detail a few days after the Skripal Novichok attacks and without his security detail. Well, this is how it went in the House of Commons. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We've sought this, UQ, despite the meltdown in the government, because it goes to the heart of our national security. Yes. Yesterday, the Prime Minister admitted to the Home Affairs and Public Accounts Committee chairs that in April 2018, as Foreign Secretary, he met with the former KGB officer Alexander Lebedev, father of Lord Lebedev, in Italy, without any officials, yep. without any security. He went there straight from a NATO meeting where the top item on the agenda was Russia. 
at the height of the Salisbury poisoning crisis, after Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia had been attacked, and before Charlie Rowley and Dawn Sturgis had been exposed to the remaining Novichek. This was a chemical weapon attack by Russian agents on British soil that targeted two British residents, had life-changing effects for a British police officer, and killed a British citizen. On the 20th of May this year, Alexander Lebedev was sanctioned by the Canadian government, a Five Eyes partner of the UK, for being one of the 14 identified people who have directly enabled Vladimir Putin's senseless war in Ukraine and bear responsibility for the pain and suffering of the people of Ukraine. The UK has not yet sanctioned him. Well, I'm delighted to be joined by Arthur Snell, an author, former diplomat. He's got a book coming out we'll talk about in a minute. But I've got to know, he's actually written for Byline Times. He wrote a great piece comparing Cromwell and Dominic Cummings. Yes, Thomas Cromwell, not Oliver Cromwell. Indeed. Um, and you've written this book basically about how British diplomacy has sort of screwed up the world a bit. Yep. Now, but you are a bit of an expert on, on Russia, would you say? Is that your... I've done a bit of work on it, yeah. Yeah, and you, and you work in Orbis with Christopher Steele, who was leading the Russia desk mm -hmm. for MI6. So can we explain to our audience who don't know um, precisely the problem of this meeting about Boris Johnson that emerged this week? So to give some context, Alexander Lebedev was a KGB officer in London, wasn't That's he? That's right. Was he a quite a senior one? Yeah, so in, in the late 80s and over into the beginning of the 90s, he was posted in London, and his job would have been to scoot around Britain finding people who would be willing to spy for Russia at that time. And the British citizens yes. who would be, yes. right. And to get information that he could feed back to Moscow. And if you're, a, if you're a Russian intelligence officer, getting an assignment in London is one of the top jobs. So he was obviously was a high flyer in the organisation. So the Soviet Union collapses in 1980, 1991. He then leaves, I assume, the KGB and then becomes a kind of media mogul, doesn't he, in Russia? Yeah. So quite early on, he, he gets into various businesses. He's in banking, he's in media. And uh, the big question, which remains to this day about, about Lebedev, Alexander Lebedev, is, is he a guy who's trying to promote sort of liberal ideas in Russian politics? And he's owned this newspaper, Novaya Gazeta, which, you know, historically has been seen as one of the few kind of liberal independent papers in Russia, or is he just a stooge of the Kremlin like a lot of these other oligarchs who are just there to sort of help out Putin? And he did fall out. So he ran this bank. He wrote a book, actually, didn't he? And uh, about falling out with Putin, has Putin on the front. Yeah. And like a lot of Russian oligarchs, sort of, there was allegations he worked with Putin in 1999 before he became president. But then Putin begins to sort of rein in his oligarchs, doesn't he? Yes. Around 2001. It's very chaotic. All, a lot of state assets have gone to individuals who then yes. have a lot of power. He reigns them in. And Alexander Sr. comes to London. Yes. Uh, uh, and he has a very dynamic and impressive son. And about 2008, he makes an offer for the Independent and the Evening, or the Evening Standard and the Independent. And I think we've tracked this. It then quite supports Boris Johnson. And they become friendly. Boris Johnson starts going to his villa in Tuscany from about 2011 onwards. Now... To give her more of a context, those liberal oligarchs, and there are some like Alexander Tomerko, who's also close to Boris Johnson, Ukrainian-born into power and energy, were estranged from Putin. Yes. But something happened, it seems to me, around about the first beginnings of the war in Ukraine 2014. They kind of get reined back in. Would it be yeah. fair to say that? I think that's right. And if you look at uh, Lebedev in particular, you know, he, at one point he was fabulously wealthy, you know, a multi-billionaire. And then a lot of his businesses didn't seem to work out. And of course, in Russia, that might mean because you haven't kept the right people happy. It may not just be bad business. You know, there can be political reasons for that. Uh, and then there seems to be a suggestion or some evidence that Lebedev then sort of shifts slightly closer back to Putin. Because ultimately, in Russia, you're either with Putin or you're overseas or you're dead. There's not much, there's not many other versions of 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 possibilities. A lot of oligarchs met strange fates around that time, uh, yes. their associates falling out of windows. And obviously, then we had, or well, before then, in 2006, a radioactive attack using Polonian on Alexander Litvinenko. And, the and so do you think, we now know that Alexander Lebedev 
by 2000 and by the invasion of Ukraine originally in 2014 after the Maidan revolution. For those who don't know, Ukrainians didn't want to go into union with Russia. The economic union wanted to go with one with the EU. There was a revolution. The pro-Putin president Yanukovych was ousted. There was a lot of violence and a much more favorable regime to the EU came in more liberal regime, and that prompted an invasion by Putin of eastern Ukraine and annexation of Crimea. Sorry, if everybody knows this, it's boring. A lot of people don't. At that moment, we can see in the public record, can't we, that both Evgeny, the son, who's, you know, nominally, and his father owning the independent and even standards, are now more close to Putin, saying that the Crimea does belong to Russia. And doesn't Boris Johnson say exactly the same thing? during the Brexit campaign. Well, indeed. So this is where, where Boris staggers into this, this sort of interesting story. Uh, Boris Johnson, of course, um, at the in 2016, you know, front man of Brexit, uh, going around the country, making all kinds of interesting arguments. And at one point, he said it was the fault of the European Union that Russia had invaded Ukraine. And when we think about Ukraine, of course, this year, we've all become, every, nobody can avoid Ukraine. But a lot of people haven't necessarily noticed that Russia began their war against Ukraine in 2014. They didn't go away. This has been a constant battle by Russia to destroy Ukraine, to undermine the territorial integrity, to attack the military, to attack other aspects of Ukrainian society, cyber attacks and so on. And at that time, 2016, as far as Boris Johnson was concerned, this was something that we would blame on the EU. And of course, at that time, he was very, very close with the Lebedevs, Alexander and his son, Yevgeny. And also the Maidan revolution, led by students and then their parents, yeah. was to join the EU. Exactly. Was that so, was literally people risking their lives to be able to join the EU. So just to flash forward then, 2018 comes yes. along. We've already, the year before, by the way, the Mueller inquiry had started going. We had evidence of Russian interference in the US elections via London. Yes. Um, and there he is, his foreign secretary. There's just been a huge provocation, a nerve agent attack on British soil, which kills a British citizen. Yes. He loses his security detail, flies to Perugia, and, and caught coming back worse for wear in the airport. Mm. And nothing is done. Yeah. And we now know, by the way, I hear from first, but maybe you can confirm Paul Karuna Galicia, <laughs> his podcast that yeah. Alexander was there, offered yes. a back channel to Putin. Now, I remember about the same time, Priti Patel going to see officials of the Israeli government without sanction, and she was sacked. Indeed. Why wasn't Boris Johnson? Well, it's fascinating, isn't it? So, to, to think back to that time, there'd been the attack in Salisbury, which obviously the target of the attack, Sergei Skripal, was a, a resettled Russian agent. But as, as you mentioned, Peter, a British citizen was killed. To this day, no one knows whether people in other ordinary citizens in Salisbury might have suffered health issues due to the nature of that attack. So it's an incredibly serious attack on our British sovereignty, to use a word that some and, people and, like. And in a military town, almost the yes. heart of the military establishment. Exactly. exactly. Salisbury, of course, yeah, very, very full of retired army people and so on. Um, and so there was a NATO summit meeting to talk about the threat of Russia. And this was attended by foreign ministers from all over Europe and, of course, including Boris Johnson. Uh, Boris attended that meeting. He comes back to London. This is all in, in, in March 2018. And then he, he jets off to Perugia without his security detail, without his spads, without his political advisor, without anyone. Well, maybe with one guest accompanying him, but certainly with no officials. And he flies to Perugia, this beautiful town in North Italy, uh, where the Lebedevs have this sort of palace, a, a kind of... Um, a pleasure dome <laughs> where, where extraordinary parties take place. And so he had gone from a secure NATO summit to talk about the threat of Russia to a meeting with a KGB officer. I mean, it, the, everything about this is, is unimaginable. I mean, if you wrote it in a spy novel, you'd say, no, but that, that's a bit crazy. You know, that would, he'd never do that. He'd never be that crazy. But and, it happened. And it, 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 there's parallels used with the perfumer affair People, yeah. I can't quite remember it. I was three years old. But it was a, a defence minister has yeah. an affair Christine, with Christine Keeler, who's also having an affair with the, an offence attached. A, a Russian defence attached, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to and, clarify, he does say he's a former 
Russian KGB. You're right. Alexander Lebedev says that he's a former Russian KGB agent. And we should listen on this particular subject to President Putin, who says, once a Czechist, which is the Russian nickname for a you know, intelligence guy. Once a Czechist, always a Czechist. And, and to be fair to uh, the reports that Canada has sanctioned Alexander yes. Lebedev because of his proximity to Putin. They we sanctioned got a whole, him this year. This year. Yeah. We got a whole of intelligence report, rather John Sweeney did, yeah. saying the Italian intelligence thought he was close to Putin. Yeah. So unlike Profumo, where we have this, a woman in between, his in there, um, and there's a back channel offered to Putin. He yes. apparently doesn't take it up. Given all that, let me ask you a question. Yes. Right? There's many, you know, could have been compromised. I know people have been to these parties. They are quite wild, maybe embarrassing. Why then has Boris Johnson been such a for, st fervent supporter of Zelensky and Ukraine? Yes, and that's actually Boris's kind of best defence is his, his, how he's behaved on Ukraine. And, you know, I will say, uh, as somebody who's... I've got no time for him. I'm delighted he's uh, leaving as Prime Minister. Um, you, you can't really fault his, his performance on Ukraine since February this or January, February this year. However, I think there's a couple of points to make there. One is, would any other British Prime Minister, with the possible exception of Jeremy Corbyn, any kind of mainstream political figure in this country would have taken that policy? You're looking, we in Britain, because we're right on the far west of Europe, we're not threatened by anything that happens in Ukraine, but we're, we've been members of NATO for, you know, since its foundation. We are part of the Western Alliance. We have a strong military. Of course we're going to support Ukraine. So on one level, you could say, well, anyone would have done that. I think the other thing uh, on this particular point is that Boris is... Uh, Boris Johnson has been consistently a brilliant political opportunist. He's somebody who can see which way the wind is blowing and jump on it. And let's just think back. In January, Boris Johnson's premiership was in, in terrible difficulty, that the whole party gate scandal uh, really, you know, the, the, the sand was dripping away. And of course, you know, with, with what we know from this week, the story's over. But back in January, he had to rescue. And, and the way he did it was by piling in with Ukraine. So I, I don't believe, you know, there are some people out there who, who've perhaps gone a bit far and they've sort of concluded that Boris was an agent of Russia. I don't believe that. I don't think, uh, I don't think if you look at his long-term policies, he particularly supported Russia. But he clearly had a series of inappropriate relationships. And going as a foreign secretary after a NATO summit to a, a private party with a former KGB officer at which a back channel to the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, you know, one of Putin's most uh, closest um, advisors. You know, all of that is just a kind of crazy level of inappropriate behaviour. Um, and in almost any other scenario, he would have been fired on the spot. And just on the wider issue, I mean, you yeah. understand this, your orbit does a lot of work around this. Lebedev is not alone. There are various Soviet-born, former Russian oligarchs yes. funded a lot of money into the Conservative yes. Party and maybe other parties. And yet we have this Russia report that came out suppressed by Boris Johnson. Twice he tried to suppress it and then tried to change the chair, it wouldn't come out. And the one thing they clearly say is, and the committee expressed outrage over this, really, effectively yeah. in their measured language, why weren't the security services tasked to look at potential Russian interference in British politics when they've clearly interfered in European and, yes. and American politics. Yes. You know these people. You've been a diplomat. Yeah. Why? Well, I think, uh, tragically, uh, what has happened in this country is that the politicisation of some of these institutions has meant that we are no longer able to keep our country secure. So it's the job of MI5 to uh, deal with the threat of counterintelligence, counterespionage, the sorts of things you'd think that Russia might be doing to us. Um, but when things get political, they get difficult. Um, I, if, if you think about, you know, the, of course, you guys at Byline, you've been tracking this across all fronts. You know, Brexit is, is a religion. It, it, it's a cult. Uh, and the, in, if you were in 2016, early 2017, uh, and a senior official saying, well, we now need to investigate the Brexit campaign, you, you, you'd, you'd be out the room. So I think what's happened is we've lost the ability in a dispassionate way to say this isn't about Brexit, it's mm -hmm. not about Tory, Labour, Lib Dem, whoever. This is about national security. Mm -hmm. This is about protecting our country. We've lost the ability to do that properly. And even, I mean, it's fascinating, even in the United States where 
for all the, you know, the, the craziness of the Trump era, they appointed an independent inquiry, the Mueller inquiry, that, you know, some people say it didn't find enough, but it, it was at least a fully constituted, independent, powerful inquiry. And the Senate intelligence. Indeed. Um, out more about Brexit. Yes. We find out more about Brexit right. and Russian interference. And just finally, would you thank the staying for After Dark, where we can ask more questions of uh, Arthur and amazing insights. But we, we do know that, don't we? I mean, we've had Russian, uh, sorry, American army reports we published, and a few have written about it from their studies. Yeah. Vladimir Putin did not like the EU after uh, the Maidan and yeah. Ukraine moving that way. Brexit was a strategic target of his. Of course, because ultimately, and I remember shortly after Brexit, I had a discussion with Swedish intelligence officers in Stockholm, and they are some of the best informed people on earth about Russia. And they said, for the Russians, getting the UK out of the EU is a triumph. Because Britain is obviously one of the militarily, the biggest military powers in Europe. We've always been hawkish on Russia. And of course, within the EU, we used to play a role of being a sort of firm security player against those that might say, well, we need to do a bit of a deal with Russia. We need to, you know. So you take UK out of the EU, you weaken the EU immediately. And, and nobody would be happier than Putin. And, and like I say, you know, don't take my word for it. Take the word of a country such as Sweden that has no party political interest, but- It's has... not in the EU, is it? That... Well, they're, they're in the yeah. EU, but they're not in NATO. NATO so... yeah. Well, they will be in NATO. Well, I know they're join, joining NATO yeah. soon. But the point is that they're looking dispassionately as well-informed outsiders, and they could read what was happening. And, and that, that's, that's an example. And you know, that view would have been consistently seen across Europe. It, it, was, it was brilliant for Putin, terrible for Europe, and obviously terrible for us. Arthur, fascinating insight, and we'll get some more afters, and we'll talk a bit about your book in the After Dark Show. Remind me of the title? How Britain Broke the World. How Britain Broke the World, published by Cambry Press, Indeed. and out next week. And before we go to talk to Otto English, let me thank, can you thank them hard? Help me thank Steve, Hardy. help me thank them, Buttons, Jazeera, Davy, Perilous, and Mary for joining Byline TV. And maybe... Yeah. If you join up, you can join the After Dark session and we're still taking the super chat function if you want to ask us a question in real time. In a moment, we'll be back with Otto English reviewing some of our cover coverage of Boris Johnson over the last three and a half, half years to his recent demise. In the meantime, here's a little promo about Byline Times and the power of the paper. What can a proper paper do? Well, a year and a half before the Colston statue came down, Byline Times is exposing the continuing legacy of the British Empire. And in the time since, we've been chronicling the divisive battles in Boris Johnson's culture war. But more importantly than that, we've been providing our readers with the understanding and the tools to fight back. Two years ago, Byline Times helped expose the reliance of Boris Johnson on hedge funds and city traders for his leadership campaign. And that was debated in Parliament. Since then, we've exposed the role of Russian oligarchs and helped release the Russia report. We've investigated cronyism at the very heart of government, not least the three billion pounds worth of COVID contracts awarded to Tory friends and donors. As a result of our work, several of the people involved in the decisions have now been removed their positions. In the wake of the Plymouth shooting, Byline Times exposed the inner workings of the incel movement so that people in the UK could understand the links between extremist misogyny, terrorism and the global war on women. At the beginning of the Covid pandemic, Byline Times was the first paper to actually expose the herd immunity scandal. More recently we've been looking at the corporate takeover of the NHS the most blatant example of which is the government's attempt to sell RGP data. We broke this story many months ago, and as a result of breaking the story, more than a million people opted out from this scheme. That is the power of the paper. That's the power of the paper. That's the power of the paper. That is the power of the paper.
and welcome back. Yes, indeed. What a busy day. What a busy week. And it's now my proud pleasure to have two great people in the city. I'm going to interview on the sofa, and that's Byline Times editor, Hardy Mathari, my co-presenter, but here she's in the hot chair, and our esteemed comedy, comedy I guess, columnist, our esteemed columnist, investigator as well as satirist and a man of many talents, Otto English. Is that enough titles? Is that enough titles? Oh, Have you got I'll enough sing, titles? I'll sing if you pay me enough. Did you like Irreversible? I didn't know quite that meant. I said Inestimable, Irreversible. Oh, yes. It's like those jackets, you can't anyway, reverse You it. were saying you got some breaking news. Yes, there is oh, some on... very exciting breaking news. As you know, uh, a week is a long time in politics. Mm -hmm. Currently, about half an hour is, is an aeon. So, um, Nadine Doris, apparently, according to Cathy Newman, is, is, has thrown a hat in the ring. Wow. Wow. Thrown her hat well, in the ring. She's considering being the next Prime Minister of this great country. And then yes. she can download, what she, whatever she does, she can download. Downstream, some, like, downstream, downstream yes. Downstream. Yeah. Like. And Swella Braverman and uh, who else is interesting candidates there for Steve Baker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Grant Chaps. There, there was somebody on on uh, poli Daily Politics today who I'd literally never heard <laughs> of. <laughs> literally never heard of. And I thought I googled him, and he'd been a. Pro I can't even remember his name now. He's been an MP since two thousand and one. He said he was considering throwing his hat in the ring, Mister Anonymous so, Backbencher. So Simon Nixon, the FT and Times columnist, makes this point that that uh, one thing Boris Johnson has done in his chaos and his incompetence, is lowered the bar mm. so that anybody thinks they could be here. Now, I'm going to start with you, Heidi, because you haven't had enough to say in this show, and I've got to take us back to one of our iconic covers, mm -hmm. Goodbye, Little Britain. This we uh, published three years ago. The paper was only half a year old, and almost immediately we were thrown into... In fact, we launched the paper on what was supposed to be the hard Brexit of the 31st mm. of March 2019, uh, Yes, and then six months later, this happened. So what is your... If we're going to look back over the, those three yeah. years, obviously you and I, but particularly you as the editor, had the sort of prophetic sense that this would become... Stop reading your own articles. Oh, that was quite good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the prophetic sense that for his claim to be a liberal cosmopolitan uh, mayor of London, but, but we knew he wasn't like that. Well, how do we know that? Well, I think, I mean, he's a populist before. I mean, you can call him authoritarian populist or, uh, you know, a sort of conservative populist or a very right-wing populist. But he's, he's a populist rather than being a liberal. And when you're led by populism, despite its name, it's not actually about people. Uh, it's about politics and how you can channel uh, messages and slogans and campaigns and divisive sort of dog whistles and culture wars uh, to, to, for political gain. And I think that was everything we'd seen of Boris Johnson ever since he's been in politics, ever since he's been in public life as a celebrity. Um, we know he's a master sort of campaigner. He connects with the public by telling them what they want to hear. And I think the campaign to leave the EU, which he led for the Vote Leave group. What was that? It was the embodiment of that um, accelerated. It was all about winning the public over, telling them things that are not true. And uh, dog whistles. To win, Let's and be dog fair. whistles to win power. And so even though, you know, again, there's some questions. I don't know. I've never met Boris Johnson. Is he actually very racist? I mean, he certainly uses racist tropes. Are you sure you've not met him? You have met no, him. I have met him, yes. yeah. But, <laughs> I, um, but, you know, he certainly uses these yeah. things to further his agenda. I don't I'm... know how liberal he would say he is or not, but what we, do, we, we did have a sense of what was that he was a populist. And I think populism is of a different order. It's not, it's not about being liberal, um, about looking at the rule of law and governance. It's, it's about going against the rules. It's about standing against the establishment. And, and just That's as a, what that front page was about. Yeah, and we'd already had, hadn't we, that first sort of, if you like, sounding the alert for his uh, election campaign to become leader, this awful column in the Telegraph calling Muslim women bank robbers and things like that. Letterboxes. So, Letterboxes, yeah. yeah. And, and, well, let's, get, let's just borrow that moment before he enters number 10 from your point of view, Otto. Did, what did you know? Well, you knew so much about him. In fact, watch... Otto's video of Boris Johnson's lies. But has it, did it shock you 
that he went this way? The, what, his prime ministerial career went the way it did? Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> I, the, the only thing that has shocked me about it is that he was even worse. <laughs> he was even worse than I thought he would be. But, uh, but that's because um, what we couldn't have anticipated in August 2019 was that just five months later, the, a pandemic mm. came out of nowhere. Uh, and that, that detail is fascinating. Uh, if the pandemic hadn't happened, yeah. I suspect Johnson would still be safe as houses and would be looking forward to perhaps a second term. Because we wouldn't have had party gate. I think it's obviously. much more than party gate. Yeah. Because, because cometh the hour, the Assats Churchill did not rise to the occasion. Because he's a fundamental... I mean, and, you know, this is what I've kept saying all these three long years... He's a fundamentally lazy, incompetent, deeply shallow, very unimaginative man. Uh, and um, in fact, I was just looking at reading, my, reading my own work there, uh, as I, you know, it's uh, that famous uh, Oscar what? Wilde line, isn't it? I like to, like to read something sensational on the train. So you read your own work? No, no, he reads his own diary, doesn't he? It's in, uh, what did you write in here? Earth. The Caligula one. Oh, yes. Now, actually, weirdly, I saw somebody far more better known than myself making that comparison the other day. Mm. Uh, I thought Boris Johnson would spend his prime ministerial career doing what he had done as mayor, planning stupid things. Like the Garden Bridge. Garden bridge. Bridges. Well, and that's how it started off. He, he said he wanted to build a bridge to Ireland or a tunnel to somewhere else or whatever. And that's what I thought he would do. So that's why I wrote that Caligula article, because famously Caligula built an enormous bridge that, and, then, and then made his horse uh, a senator. And I thought it would be that kind of craziness that we would face. But of course, we had the pandemic. And, and so I think, I think the pandemic will come to be seen to, uh, to be Boris Johnson's downfall. He's, he's actly not Winston Churchill. At, who's, who's oh, sorry, not Attlee. <laughs> no, he's, he's Neville Chamberlain, right. not Winston Churchill, yeah. Okay, so he backs off the air. Heidi, let's go back then to that moment. Obviously, there's another moment before uh, the pandemic, which is the prorogation of Parliament, another example of lawlessness, like vote leave. But that also affected Trump, didn't it? He was riding to win, and this thing comes along which proves the mettle of a person. Remind us of those dark days of early 2020. He was absent a lot of the time writing a book away, Cobra Media. And then we discovered he's, his, his original way of dealing with the mm. coronavirus was this a Superman thing and herd immunity. Yeah, I mean, those days were really, really chaotic. And, and you know, to be fair, you know, a, a pandemic is not something we've ever really had to deal with in modern times here. So this is not to excuse him, but it, it did take them by shock, which it would have done. Uh, but then, instead of getting everything in order, attending meetings and being really quick to act, Johnson didn't do that at all. As you say, he didn't turn up to Cobra meetings. He was still going... He was saying he was meeting people in hospitals and shaking hands. He said, all we need to do is wa wash our hands while singing happy birthday. There was no sense of urgency. There were... Everything was... You know, the airports were still open. There were horse Shout races them. going on. There was all sorts of things. And I guess what emerged was a few media appearances in the space of a week week, in relatively early days of the pandemic, where he was sort of making these statements about uh, there is a theory about letting it rip through the population. Yes. There was then Sir Patrick Vallance, you know, one of the government scientific advisors who was saying, mentioning herd immunity, later it emerged that it was either Matt Hancock, who's the health secretary of Boris Johnson, had told the Italian, the Italian health minister that yeah. they were going for herd immunity, and this speech just before the coronavirus hit. And he said, and Boris Johnson was making a speech about trade and said, well, now there's this new coronavirus and people are saying we need to shut shut down economies to protect people. And what we need is someone to go into the phone booth and come out dressed like Clark Kent and keep going and keep everything open because they have to be freedom loving. So there was this strain, we talk about him being liberal, but there's a difference between being liberal and libertarian. 
And so there was this notion that uh, this herd immunity approach had taken hold and there just wasn't a fast approach and therefore lots of people died. But one of the things that's interesting about the, the pandemic era as a whole, when we look at Johnson, though, is, you know, I think someone asked me this week, was one of your most memorable uh, moments in the three years? And everything that's happened in the last year has been awful in terms of public life and the party gate. But for me, I really do, I so remember exactly where I was and exactly how I felt, where Dominic Cummings was giving that speech for Ooh. his conference in the Rose Garden. Rose Garden. And I, I absolutely still remember sitting there when he said, you know, and I decided to, to test my eyes to drive the car to Barnard Castle. With my and kid. for me, that was, that was it. I mean, everything that's come after is... so, But that... Something fundamentally broke because I realised that they, they were saying to us, you're going to have to believe this. And subsequently, I mean, it's quite clear why Dominic Cummings was so protected by everyone in the cabinet. Because he... by this point, all these parties already started mm. been taking place. <coughs> so he probably said to them, if you don't back me up, I've got a phone full of photos <laughs> of all of you at these parties. Mm. And there was something about that moment for me. It just, it, it just completely broke. And I think everything we saw after that, as Otto is saying, you know, was, it made everything worse. It didn't, it was such a bad crisis. It just didn't leave any space for all of the usual things that probably would have gone on, on under the surface to be left uncovered. Well, one other aspect of the coronavirus was, of course, the vast amount of government contracts which were handed out for testing and PPE. And right from the beginning, from April 2020, a piece by Nafis Ahmed and then followed up by 50 or 60 pieces by Sam Bryant and the rest of the team, we began to uncover some familiar, if disturbing, patterns about these billions handed out in government contracts. Here's Sam Bright earlier today to talk about that phase of Boris Johnson's scandals. Corruption has been one of the defining features of Boris Johnson's premiership. Um, obviously, we've seen that heavily during the um, coronavirus pandemic with contracts awarded to various companies with close ties to the Conservative Party. So Byline Times and The Citizens exposed the fact that £3 billion in COVID contracts have been awarded to uh, firms with links to conservative donors or conservative associates. Um, and that has really been a driving force of this government is a reliance on those who went to university with members of the regime who are business partners of those close to the Johnson government. Um, and this is extended as well to appointments to government departments. We all remember um, who exactly uh, Matt Hancock was caught in an embrace with um, just before he resigned as a minister. It was someone who he had appointed as the non-executive director of his department on a £15,000 a year salary who we'd gone to university with and that sort of epitomized um johnson's approach um throughout his regime and i think i think it's not just johnson himself that's done this obviously the scale of coronavirus spending uh, the tentacles of government are vast but i think that his attitude towards the democracy um has essentially allowed this to take place it's sort of rubber stamped corruption and cronyism in government. You know, this is a man who went to an elite school in Eton. He was proudly a member of the Bullingdon Club, which is um, Oxford University's uh, most sordid, elitist society, where they go around burning um, pound notes in front, of, uh, in front of homeless people. And so the old school tie has always been something that Boris Johnson has clung to. And that's been the case in government as well. As soon as a crisis hit, um, Boris Johnson and his ministers searched for their phone book. And who did they land upon? They landed upon Conservative Party donors. And those were the people who were commissioned um, to the tune of billions of pounds um, to do work on behalf of us all during the pandemic.
Just to remind you in this extended uh, special edition, we have super chat function. So if you want to ask myself or to a hard deeper question or make a comment, just Wah! let your steam off as we can say it as long as it's not too you know, defamatory or obscene, uh, we will pass your comments on. So we saw there, Otto Hardy, that this free market, Johnson, the free market, you know, conservative, blah, 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 fair, free market, turned out not to be so true. VIP lanes for your mates. Of course, and around about that time, we had all the business coming out about the wallpaper and the money he mm. was receiving. That was during the, a famous, I remember we did a front page with me, Hardy, with the wallpaper, which we're now seeing more of, and that whole ridiculous flat and the tragic wall opposite the, by St. Thomas's of the mm. coronavirus victims. Something else happened in 2020. When this was going on with Locked at Home, they really ramped up the culture wars, wasn't mm. it? Right. Do you want to start to... Because you, you have a memory of this. So it's all going... Not so great with the pandemic. Oh, what do they do? They try to stir up trouble with culture wars. Yes, so after the uh, George Floyd death in the States in... March. March or April. Mm. I'm afraid I can't remember the date. But anyway, you then had the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, I don't think protest is really the right word. Demonstration, I think, yeah. uh, the sort of outpouring of um, grief and of um, anger, understandable anger, which, of course, came to the UK. And uh, I think that's probably the trigger point, although they, 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 they had been blabbering on and talking about it. But they've been waving yes. a lot of flags. Been, remember there's there's a flag a whole, thing, there was flag uh, shagging going. Very, I mean, that really came in post... January 20... So the end... 31st of January 2020, we left the EU. Oh, right. And do you remember there was that huge bong. thing about bong, bongs for Brexit? Oh, bong a very bong a bob. Bong a bob for, to bong for Brexit. Brexit. Or whatever, all the bees. Uh, Boris number 10 is, wasn't working at that point, was the, it? The, the, bell? the bell wasn't ringing and people were crying about that. You know, there's a, pan, a global pandemic coming. I mean, what you were saying earlier, I think a really important point to remember is... We could see that pandemic coming in our direction. It hit Italy, mm. it hit every other European country, and then it came to us. Uh, in a weird bit of timing, the first two people in the UK to be tested for coronavirus mm. were done so on the 31st of January 2020. So the very day that everybody was gathered in Parliament Square singing Rule Britannia and Julia Hartley Brewer wearing her sort of Union Jack dress, I think, a memory which I'm still trying to shift from my mind. Uh, Traumatic. They, yes, they were, um, they were, those two people were tested. And then the culture wars thing started and then the flags were put up everywhere and then you got this sort of empty nationalism and these cries of, oh, they're going to try and pull Churchill's statue down. Because, of course, they had pulled Edward Colston's statue down. Who was a slave trader. Who was a slave trader. Uh, and, of course, Edward Colston's statue should have been pulled down years ago. <laughs> it's the most egregious insult to everybody that that statue was allowed to stand for such a long time. The man grew rich on slavery. It's the most appalling thing to have standing in a city. And yet, they allowed this statue to stand long after local people had asked for it to be removed. So that went. And then the media and the Conservative Party turned it into, oh, they're going to go after Winston Churchill. I mean, they were never, no one was ever going to pull down Winston Churchill's statue. It's a ridiculous suggestion. But they, that opened this cultural nonsense, which has gone on for, for what, two years now. It's ridiculous. So how do you think? The expert, in a way, since you edited our book, Woke Law, uh, copies available in all good bookshops now, which looks at the war and woke, woke uh, which Otto's really talking about. This was obviously a concerted plan, wasn't it? In America, they were doing it after Black Lives Matter. Swella Braverman uses this a kind of ship, a leadership hopeful. Uh, current Attorney General used this word cultural Marxism. We couldn't move for cultural Marxism. So around about that time, this culture war launches. How does it go? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think it fails. But there, it, 
There are two things here, I think. Not only was the culture war employed as a tool to further this sort of Johnson populist administration, because I think as the former attorney general who's kicked out of his party, Dominic Greaves sat here and said, when you've got, when all you've got is chaos um, mm. and the ability to whip up divisions, mm. and if you don't have anything to offer that's substantial in terms of policy or a vision, as Boris Johnson didn't beyond Brexit, then you've got to, you, you've got to do something to cover sure. that up. Yeah. yeah. So it was both a, a kind of a, a tool to further a project and to distract from the lack of a project. Oh, right, right. But also, I think, to some extent, I think they did, believe in it. You know, I think there was a lot of, you know, some people might have seen me earlier on in the week talking to some commentators about this, saying support who were supportive of Brexit and the Conservatives, and they kept mentioning patriotism. Mm. And I think there was a sense that this was at the heart of what the Brexit project, you know, embodied and what they needed to continue with. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think the, the flashpoint really came with the Euros. And it was, yeah, it was a bit of an iconic moment where, obviously, just to recap, mm. the, in, the England team, uh, you know, very diverse team, uh, lots of footballers, also very invested in social justice, sort of campaigning with free school meals. Uh, just before their, some of their matches, they were doing very well. Uh, Peter Pretty Patel said it was gesture politics for them before the match started to take the knee uh, in solidarity with sort of racial and uh, societal injustice. She said it was gesture politics. Boris Johnson sort of con said he more or less agreed with her. And then, obviously, they got all the way to the final, but we missed, we lost it on penalties. But the three players who lost the penalties, missed the penalties, were, you know, they were of colour. Mm. And that, you know, unleashed a whole lot, lot of ra racism, I think, from a minority of people. Mm. Because, again, this myth that Britain's this... I mean, I sound like someone who's more right-wing. This myth that Britain's this horrible racist place is also, you know, that is also misplaced. So anyway, unleashed this thing and Pretty Patel put out a tweet and said how awful all this racism against the players was. And Tyrone Mings, who's part of the team, said there's absolutely, you can't on one hand say it's just mm. politics and now say you're sympathetic. Mm. We don't want that. And I think what we saw from, you know, arts and the cultural world, you know, bands and people in, you know, film stars and everyone uh, loved that moment. And she never responded. She mm. kind of went quiet after that for a while. And I think it was them hitting reality, that the reality of this country, and this was an England team, you know, not a great British team, an England team. We tend to associate in England with sort of a, a small sort of in England nationalism. But this was an England team and lots of people, uh, you know, didn't support the racism that was directed toward these players. And they agreed with Tyrone Mings. And Gareth Southgate, of course. And Gareth Cat. Southgate, Ooh, dear America. England. Dear England, fantastic. So it was, it was a signal that no matter how much you can keep whipping these things up, the country in reality is different. And I think that's where, you know, there's a balance to be had about looking at our history, being more honest about it. But there's also something to be said about not over-egging, um, oh, sort of, you know, yeah. the fact that this country isn't a liberal country, that we it is diverse and we do really care about that. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a point, it's a, a hobby horse of mine. It's, if you look at the uh, uh, polling of, you know, opinions of what British people think, people are fairly liberal-minded. Oh, they've got more so. The river, and have, and get more so, power was wrong. And, get, and get much more so over time. So, um, and uh, it's a really important point to make. The other really important point to make is that most people, even in the last general election, didn't vote for the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. And by dint of that, voted for broadly liberal uh, parties. So the Labour Party, the Greens, the Lib Dems. SMP. I mean, it's the SNP in Scotland uh, pl played in uh, Wales. Yes, the number is only, if you add it all up, it's not a huge majority mm. for, for a more liberal England. But the Conservatives have been so brilliantly effective at corralling uh, Brexity-minded, nationalist, patriot, culture wars, and I have to say a lot of angry people uh, together, they have effectively found a way to win the 2019 election, and they might win another election using the same principles, because our first-past-the-post system is not fit for purpose and this is a huge problem. But 
we can at least say, I think, safely that in 2021, when it came to the culture wars, 1 0 to our side. Mm. Um, we do. Or to decency. To decency, yeah, our yeah. side. 1 0 one one, to, one to decency. Decency yeah. and not stoking up the flames of mm. resentment. Uh, we do. We mustn't forget, though, because around the same time, 2001, there were these two lasting, wonderful monuments to the war against woke GB News and Talk TV were mm. as announced. So the great thing is we have this rich tapestry of fantastic broadcasting that came out of this moment, said he, ironically. <laughs> um, right, let's go a bit further into this culture. We talked about the culture wars, but what about the culture of misogyny? and toxic masculinity that Boris Johnson appears to have brought to Parliament. Earlier, we talked to our chief social affairs and European reporter, Sean Norris, about this. Since before Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, he had a track record of making offensive statements about women, including statements that normalise sexual harassment and normalise the sort of sexual objectification of women. So perhaps it's no surprise that under his governance in Parliament, we've seen this sort of record-breaking amount of sexually abusive behaviour and claims of sexual harassment and investigations of sexual harassment. Now, this is not to say in any way that Johnson is responsible for those individuals' behaviour. The only person responsible for sexual harassment and sexual assault is the perpetrator themselves. But I think we do need to ask questions about a process of normalisation of misogyny and a normalisation of sexism. If the boss at the top is comfortable saying unpleasant things about women, is comfortable about making jokes about sexual harassment, then that sends a signal to people, well, to men, who want to commit those behaviours and who want to behave badly, that they can do so. And of course, this also combines with this sort of toxicity of power in Westminster, where men are really sent a message that they're unaccountable, that they have power and they can exert that power in any way they want. So, Hardy, I mean, you've written a lot and we've commissioned a lot of work about, and Otto, you've written brilliant, about Boris Johnson's cultural background. Eton, you know, his work at the Telegraph, sex, sex for lying, as a, and then goes to the, sorry, for the Times, then goes to the Telegraph, lies about the EU. One thing that's difficult to talk about, because it's your personal life, and we do think the personal lives are personal and private, is he hasn't got a great track record with his relationships with women, though he's a father again, and hopefully all the best with Carrie. But we've documented on Byline Times, haven't we? This is 56 investigations into sexual misconduct in Parliament itself. Do you think that personality he brought, I think Sonia Pennell, his biographer, said he kind of gets away with it, he mm -hmm. kind of drives around in a fast car, it pulls the birds, you know, it does, and it's, we find it a bit repulsive, but, and, and sort of infantile. I mean, but some Tory MPs look up to that and want to be like that. Mm. Do you think that has influenced the culture and this sort of toxic masculinity? And it's not just men against women, men against other men, especially with the Chris Pincher story. Do you think that has an effect, Boris Johnson? Yeah, I think impunity is the biggest thing that sits at the centre of Boris Johnson and where that meets a culture which is already in existence around the media, around politics, in environments like, you know, uh, journalism parties, dinner parties with politicians and Westminster itself. He, you know, there is a, that culture predates Johnson, let's be clear. Mm. It's not something he brought uniquely with him. But the level of impunity that someone like him has enjoyed, uh, I think, really accelerates that culture accelerates the level of cover-up and the level of abuse that can be perpetrated because you've got someone who sits at the top of that system now who's been elevated despite everyone around him knowing he shouldn't have been elevated and a person who doesn't think rules should apply to him or people like him um, and, and doesn't really want to hold himself to the standards expected of somebody in that position. So the fact that 
he, there has been, I think, an acceleration under Johnson. And I think it's part of the persona. You know, when Donald Trump... I mean, we make these comparisons, even Andrew Neil made the comparison this week uh, on Twitter. But, you know, Donald Trump, there was all sorts of things coming oh. out in his election campaign Ooh, about yeah, grabbing grab women. And, yeah. and that seemed to, you know, make him more popular in some people's eyes. I think both with, to some extent, with the public and within media and political circles. The fact that Boris Johnson is, you know, a bit of a ladies' man, he's a funny journalist, appears on TV, he's a politician, despite the fact he's apparently got a wife and a family in the background of all this, that just made him attractive. And I think too many people bought into that culture. Can I, just two points of information, because you've written and uh, done a, a piece for Byline TV on Jennifer Curry, that scandal there was buried. A definitive scandal we've forgotten in our history of scandals for the last two years, Owen Patterson. Mm -hmm. This is a money back to crony contracts, a lobbying scandal. And there's kind of indicative dinner. You talk about this, you know, he's in this group of people where he's at the COP20 conference. 26. 26, sorry, COP26 uh, in Glasgow. And he flies back mm. to the Garrett Club yeah. to meet Telegraph journalists to discuss how they'll get Owen Patterson off this inquires yeah, found him well, guilty. It wasn't for that purpose. It was like uh, a dinner for the Telegraph journalists. But that was but discussed. Charles Moore was there. And he lobbied him yes. and he went him off. So that kind of confirms your thing. What do you think about the connection between these power nexuses and misogyny or kind of male entire... We often use the phrase Bullingdon Britain. Now, the Bullingdon Club had no female members. Maybe it does now. But no, it kind of... doesn't have female members. Um, so, I, I, so, I mean, I can bring, once again, your favourite subject, I can bring my public school background to the fore. Gosh, did you go to yeah. public school? Yeah. I didn't know that. So, I was, I mean, I'm... I'm a bit younger than Boris Johnson, but not much. And I, I didn't go to Eton, but I went to a public school, which was all boys. And uh, a, an all boys boarding school uh, has a lot of problems with it. Uh, one of them is that there are no women. In fact, the only women you ever meet as, uh, I mean, it's changed a bit now, I'm told. But the only women or members of the opposite sex that you ever meet are people cleaning cleaning the floors, taking away the dishes, uh, maybe the wife of a teacher. A uh, when, I was, when I was at boarding school, uh, late 80s, in the whole time I was there, there I had one female teacher. She taught French. It was one. And the only other woman I ever met was the matron. So in the houses, in the boarding houses, you had the matrons, who's a kind of nanny figure. Mm. Um, a lot of people who come out of that education therefore deem women, as they deem ordinary people who do not go to private schools, as a sort of second tier. They're the, they're the people who patch up your knee when you fall over or take away your plates or do those things. It's, it's, uh, it's an incredibly weird, curious, primitive society in which women do not feature and as a result a lot of public school boys of that ilk who came out of that era and i'm saying things have changed massively now uh were incredibly sexist uh, and didn't understand women and saw women either as sexual objects or mother figures wow. now i'm not about to psychoanalyze our prime minister because i'm not a psychoanalyst and he's however, not on the couch with us and he's not on the couch so it would be um unprincipled however uh, I knew a lot of people like Boris Johnson at school. I knew a lot of people like Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, and uh, th the attitudes to women back then uh, were, and to girls generally, were incredibly sexist, even by the standard of the times, and the bar was low. So I think um, the fact that, as I've said to you before, essentially the Palace of Westminster is a giant public school. Mm, mm. If you've been to a public school, and I spent a lot of time in the Palace of Westminster because, as you know, my mother used to work and I have friends who were there. So I've spent a lot of time in the Palace of Westminster. It is very reminiscent of a 1980s and previous mm. public school. People are clearing the plates away still. Uh, it's a very, very, very male atmosphere. The, the people who run it, the, you know, up until recently, Black Rod, all of those characters, they're all the clerks tended to be men. You're in this very, very male environment. And 
up until really only 20, 30 years ago, with very few women MPs, the only women present tended to be secretaries and people like that. And, and politicians would famously um, hire attractive secretaries and then uh, uh, very frequently have some kind of relationship with them. Cecil Parkinson famously. But yeah, I mean, it was way beyond that. I mean, my mother, who worked in Parliament in the 60s, quite openly told me, my mother was a secretary in the 60s and 70s, she said everybody was having affairs and sexual harassment was rife. Wow. I mean, rife. Uh, and I think this administration, in fact, since the Cameron years, you have seen a turn back. Because remember, from um, uh, Alec Douglas Hume onwards, there was only one privately educated prime minister of this country. Yes. Tony Blair. Yeah. Right? Mm. Yeah. So between, between Alec Mar Douglas... Margaret Thatcher's grammar school. They all, jo all went to grammar school. Yeah. It was the Eden, um, Macmillan, uh, and Alec Douglas Hume characters became dinosaurs, they were extinct dinosaurs, and it seemed like that era passed. Since the return of the Etonians, since the return of public schoolboys in office, mm -hmm. uh, right, and the Jacob Rees-Mogg thing, you have had almost a sort of throwback just like, just like he's the Assats Churchill, you've had a throwback to that patrician, sort of Edwardian thing. And, and with it, you're going to have all of the incumbent sexism, I think. There were two striking things just in the last week that I think are worth mentioning about mm. Johnson and taking it from the sort of cultural concerns to looking a bit about him, which was to do with the Chris Pincher scandal, both of these things. So he had said to so he had gone round the tea rooms, apparently, around Palace of Westminster and said to other Conservative MPs who were with Chris Pincher in the Carlton Club on the night that he says he uh, groped people, he admitted that. Uh, Boris Johnson says to these other MPs, why didn't you stop him? Why didn't you stop him? And when he was questioned about the scandal during the liaison committee appearance that he did uh, in the middle of the week, he was asked about this again. And he said, well, I think that... He asked about whether there's a problem in part Westminster of this culture of impunity. He said, I think certainly I've been very resistant to say it, but some people can't take their drink. Mm. And so in both of these circumstances, what you see is, he, you know, he, the <coughs> culture that he surrounds himself with is also a culture he looks at through the lens of a lack of response, mm. taking you know, not taking individual responsibility. So for him, it's always somebody else's watch and someone else's fault. And for me, that's why I, I don't... He didn't immediately resign. I think he eventually went after, you know, even Nadim Zahawi, who'd been... He's still an MP. For, he's still an MP, but yeah. eight hours, you know, he'd been a chancellor and he finally resigned. But I honestly think Johnson... He, he kind of saw the writing was on the wall, but I don't think he wanted to resign because that would have to... He would have to admit responsibility and he doesn't take responsibility no. and he's deluded himself with his own stories about that and so no. when he finally did resign as you wrote for us Otto there was no responsibility no. So, it was it was, was a herd instinct some sort they of they want to get rid yeah, of me yeah. is that yeah, yeah. it was it's, absolutely it's no eccentric no word no, no. of no he word of it. it he cannot do it I've not I've done not sorry I've done anything wrong okay so we're near coming to the final bit of this a uh, number three Three, 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 sorry, not three. I see you've got a super chat. I will ask at the end. It's a very good question in a way to begin to close the show. But let's look now at what Boris Johnson's legacy will be. He's been in office, as Otto noticed, with his great aptitude for calendars and dates, and exactly the same amount of time as Neville Chamberlain. Hence, he makes that comparison. Hence, you should always read his book, Faith History, which is top of the bestseller list in Gatwick Airport. <laughs> was. 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 <laughs> um, what does Boris Johnson leave behind after these three years? And who better to tell us that than our political editor, who's been following Boris Johnson since 2011, and that's Adam Bienkov. So all politicians are obsessed with their legacy, what they will be remembered by once they've gone. Uh, and there isn't a huge amount to remember from Boris Johnson's premiership, uh, other than the crises that have defined him from the coronavirus pandemic to Partygate and Ukraine. And of course, most notably, Brexit. Uh, 
Boris Johnson came to widest public prominence because of his involvement in the Leave campaign. And his involvement in that campaign was widely credited with securing the Brexit referendum for the, the Leave side. Since becoming Prime Minister, he also managed to get Brexit through the House of Commons after years in which Theresa May failed to do so. And we left the European Union at the start of 2020. However, we haven't actually seen a huge amount of uh, positive impact on the UK since then, other than a collapse in, all we've really seen is a collapse in UK trade uh, and new barriers to living and working with our European neighbours, uh, a new fresh new crisis in Northern Ireland over the Northern Ireland Protocol, trade between the Great Britain and, and uh, Northern Ireland, and a, a deterioration uh, of the relationship between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and now the, the prospect of a second independence referendum in Scotland. But when you're actually looking for the benefits of Brexit, what has actually materially improved people's lives in the UK since we've left, it's very hard to find anything. And actually, Boris Johnson and his allies struggle to define that as well. When, when the Prime Minister was asked recently what the benefits of Brexit are, all he could come up with was putting crown stamps back on pint glasses. And his so-called Brexit Opportunities Minister, Jacob Rees-Mogg, when he was asked what his priority was for changing UK laws now that we've left the European Union, all he could the, the first thing that sprung to his mind was being able to change the spacing of emergency exit signs in the Dartford Tunnel. Neither of these things are going to really dramatically change people's lives and, and shows the paucity of ambition of, of those people who, who led the Brexit process in the first place. So that's Johnson's legacy. A bit like the china shop after the bulls departed. Right, to wrap up, I'm going to slightly use number three's uh, super chat to look to the future. Uh, number three asks, is a government of national unity viable? Which is in a crisis, all parties come together. Happened in World War Two. Did it happen in World War One as well? Otto? Yeah. Right. Okay. Usually happens. They in copied. Modern. They World War Two. They they just did what they'd done the first time round. Did it happen in other national crises? Like because um, we've got. Let's not forget we've got a, a crisis coming. Well, they forward. called for it during uh, the Mine's immediate post Brexit era, didn't they? People called for it then. I can't see it happening now because the, the Tory majority is too big. Except maybe if the war extends beyond Ukraine, if the cost of living crisis. But we didn't have one during COVID, so that was a problem. Yeah, I mean, that would be the moment, wouldn't it? It would have been the moment to do it, but the, there's no need for the Tories to do it. I don't. So uh, your answer is, <coughs> I think we'd both agree, he's the expert, fake history, fake to read, <coughs> um, is that it's not viable at the moment, but who knows? So just looking, just let's conclude then. After this tumultuous two and a half years, I wouldn't say the byline time's built on the back of Boris Johnson. It's certainly been <coughs> a consistent theme. Otto, how does this leave you feeling? Um, so, I don't feel... I won't feel entirely happy until Boris Johnson's out of that building. I feel depressed that he hasn't taken ownership of his uselessness. <coughs> Sorry. And I feel... Um, Already people are going, oh, he was a great prime minister, he's been kicked out, and well, da 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 yeah, The papers. <coughs> so I think we're going to have that to come. However, I am an eternal optimist, and I do, th I, I do think Brexit and the pandemic have shone a light on a lot of things that are wrong with this country, which need to change. Our, you know, our system of... Thank you a little bit of water. Um, our system of electing politicians needs to change. We have to, the fact all these politicians keep popping up over the last few days and no one's ever noticed them before demonstrates another hobby horse of mine, which is that this country has the second largest number of representatives in the world after the Republic of China, right? Why has this small country got so many MPs, a lot of them anonymous? Anyway, I think a lot of those things, those are topics for the future and we can start to have those conversations. I think there's a conversation around keeping Parliament at the Palace of Westminster. Yeah. I think there's, 
a massive discussion, having had my kids go through the pandemic with these exams, as to why we're still doing sort of 19th century educational system and, and testing people in the exam days. And there's a whole load of conversations around that. And I think um, we also have to start thinking about how we do leadership. Because the idea that one person, in an almost semi-presidential way, gets elected to the top and becomes the focus is, is very unhealthy, mm -hmm. I think. We, so we need more mature government, and maybe that's something Labour can provide if they manage to get to power. Well, Skistama didn't have to resign. He hadn't broken that down. Well, exactly. So he's slightly less hedonistic than Boris Johnson. Adi, yes, I mean, one thing we should make mention in his legacy is Brexit. That mm -hmm. was his legacy, but it's probably not been done, and it turns out most people now think it's a mistake. So do you agree with Otto that he has he's opened the landscape, Brexit and Johnson go together, of what was always wrong with this country? I do agree with that, and I think Brexit has been emblematic of, of something that was never really about what it was claim to be about. And I think that change that it's had in our politics and our culture, in, you know, the, the lack of uh, plurality and compromise, moving to absolutist positions and uh, divisions, I think that will stay with us. But I think for me, you know, looking at how do I feel about all of this, I think I would say politics matters because because who you elect, it might, you know, to people trying to just get on in their ordinary lives, it might not seem like a priority, especially when, how the hell are they gonna help you or do anything that touches your life? But there will come a time when there will be somebody in power and something like the pandemic oh. happens. And then we're talking about lives and 180,000 people have died from COVID-19 and we can, we can, you know, there's another discussion to be had about the, the right, if there is such a thing, approaches that we could have taken compared to other countries and what happened. But we do know that 180,000 people is a very high number for a country of our stature. Mm. How do we lose all those people? And so it does matter. Politics, ultimately, it does matter mm. who's in charge when something like that happens because you pay with your life. And I think that's the thing about Johnson's populism, despite what it claims. It's, it's got nothing to do with, you know, people. It's, it's about politics mm. and sustaining power for the few. And I think, for me, that's the legacy. So absolutely, Brexit has put us in a completely different political landscape. But the coronavirus crisis, on whose, you know, and it was on his watch that mm. all those people died, I just think... You know, for people watching this show, for people not watching this show, for people walking down the street now, those, they will never get those people back. And so my one thing is, I hope this leads to some sort of renewal in the sense that people will think, God, it actually, it does matter. Well, thank you. Oh, sorry. Well, can I just say one last thing? It's brilliantly put. The Brexit was an indulgence that you could only have in a country that people had spent decades, decades making better and safer. You know, the post-war consensus, the joining of the EU, people were lulled into a sense that everything was safe, mm. everything was okay, no disaster was gonna come over the horizon, that, you know, the famously Cameron uh, talked about the risk to our defences of leaving the EU and people mocked him and said, ha, 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 he said there's a third world war coming. There was no well, here we are, with Ukraine and Russia going on. The, the self-indulgence at the heart of Brexit is something that is not talked about enough. The, the, the willingness to shake and break and scrap all of those securities that my father and my grandfathers and millions of other people's fathers and grandfathers had fought for in two world wars is the thing that should leave us angry. And it was all done ultimately for the benefit of one man, Boris Johnson, who had dreamed since childhood of becoming Prime Minister. And so the last thing I would like to say is the man is an utter, utter disgrace. He's disgraced himself to this country and to our political systems. And if I never heard his name uttered ever again, I think I might grow my hairline back. On that note, 
we can at least admit and accept that Boris Johnson has made a difference. As Hardy points out, politics matters. Sometimes it matters negatively. If you lose a loved one because they were discharged out of hospital without testing into care, infected others, that matters. When people are attacked, racist taunts, that matters. When papers, as we're saying today, congratulating Johnson, his former, their, his former employee of theirs, that matters because we're being lied to. They pull it from the Times. These are passionate times. Thank you for staying with us. And thank you, Paul Rangecroft, for your super chat saying thank you. No, thank you for listening and all your support. We know that we sometimes get it wrong. I'm sure you disagree with us. But you know we're in a conversation with you. These have been a tough three years. And who knows if they'll get better. As Otto points out, there's war in Europe for the first time in 77 years. There is a looming cost of living crisis. But as Hardeep always points out, we survive by fellowship, by looking after each other and looking after the truth. Thanks for joining us. We'll be putting the print edition to bed next week. It'll be out for your consumption if you want to subscribe on bylinetimes.com. Anybody else, in five minutes at 20 to 9, we'll be having our Q&A with Otto and Arthur. It'll be fascinating. All you have to do is press the little green button on YouTube or go to patreon.com forward slash byline TV or our preferred option, go to byline.tv, join, and in the members area, we'll see you in five minutes. Thanks for being with us tonight and this long journey getting rid of Boris Johnson. Good night. What can a proper paper do? Well, a year and a half before the Colston statue came down, Byline Times is exposing the continuing legacy of the British Empire. And in the time since, we've been chronicling the divisive battles in Boris Johnson's culture war. But more importantly than that, we've been providing our readers with the understanding and the tools to fight back. Two years ago, Byline Times helped expose the reliance of Boris Johnson on hedge funds and city traders for his leadership campaign. And that was debated in Parliament. Since then, we've exposed the role of Russian oligarchs and helped release the Russia report. We've investigated cronyism at the very heart of government, not least the three billion pounds worth of COVID contracts awarded to Tory friends and donors. As a result of our work, several of the people involved in the decisions have now been removed from their positions. In the wake of the Plymouth shooting, Byline Times exposed the inner workings of the incel movement so that people in the UK could understand the links between extremist misogyny, terrorism and the global war on women. At the beginning of the Covid pandemic, Byline Times was the first paper to actually expose the herd immunity scandal. More recently, we've been looking at the corporate takeover of the NHS, the most blatant example of which is the government's attempt to sell RGP data. We broke this story many months ago, and as a result of breaking the story, more than a million people opted out from this scheme. That is the power of the paper. That's the power of the paper. That's the power of the paper. That is the power of the paper.